All right, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I want to do a huge welcome to all of you joining us live and on YouTube as we wrap up day one of our epic climate fest. So all week long, as many of you may know, and you can check all of these out on our website, we are doing 23 incredible programs over five days with climate scientists, researchers, and explorers from around the globe. Today alone, we've talked about marine plastics in the Arctic. We've gone up to Svalbard in northern Norway to be joined live by the Hearts and the Ice Ladies, and we just wrapped up with Krista Langlois talking about the Marshallese Islands being flooded by the effects of climate change. It has truly been a global festival today, a really exciting tour of some of the big impacts and solutions for climate change. Right now, we are going to dive in in Arctic research again with Dr. William Halliday. He is with the Wildlife Conservation Society of Canada, and his work takes him up to one of the most remote and amazing places in the world to understand the marine soundscapes, all those cool creatures that are under the water, um, how they're affected by human impact, including climate change. And it's always a great pleasure having him. He's one of the, my favorite speakers we have on this broadcast. So without further ado, joining us live in British Columbia, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Halliday to blow our minds. Thank you so much for joining us, Bill, and take us away. Hey, everyone. Thank you for uh, tuning in today. I'm just going to take a moment to share my screen here, and then we can get going. All right, so here we go. So my name is Bill Halliday. I work for Wildlife Conservation Society Canada, just like Jesse said. Uh, I'm also an uh, adjunct professor at the University of Victoria. So I get the, the chance to work with lots of really great students here in Victoria, British Columbia. So today I'm gonna talk to you about my work with Arctic marine mammals and climate change. Uh, before that though, a bit about myself. So who am I? So I grew up in Northern Ontario and I got my first taste of research working with lemmings on Herschel Island. If you don't know where Herschel Island is, I'll show you in a minute on the map, but it is Canada's northwestmost island out in the Arctic Ocean. I spent 10 weeks there uh, working with lemmings. Uh, lemmings are small little rodents um, like mice or uh, voles. So spent all summer out on the tundra on this island working with lemmings and that was pretty fun. Then during my doctoral research, I worked on snakes and beetles, uh, habitat selection, why they choose where to live. And now here I am again, back up in the Arctic with my current work on Arctic marine mammals. So all this to say, I have kind of a variable background with lots of different experiences with different animals. And this just happens to be what I'm working on right now. But, uh, but I love working with animals, especially working on questions um, that have to do with how we can conserve these species. So where have I worked? This map up here kind of gives you a synopsis. The yellow stars are places where I've actually been based. So I started in Northwestern Ontario and Thunder Bay, and then I went over to Ottawa for my doctoral research, and now I'm based in Victoria over on the west coast of Canada. The red stars are all the places where I've done research. So my first foray into research was this red star up in the western Canadian Arctic. Um, actually, there's a small, small island right on the coast of Alaska. That's Herschel Island, and that's where I was on my very first summer. Um, and I've also worked in the central Canadian Arctic, and then for my PhD work around Ottawa and western Quebec, um, as well as a little 10-day research trip down in southern Arizona in the Chiricahua Mountains. So I've kind of been all over the place here, at least in North America. Now let's actually get into the interesting part, enough about me. Uh, the Arctic is home to some pretty cool animals, pretty cool marine mammals especially. We've got bowhead whales, the longest living um, mammal of any. Uh, they're, they're known to be more than 200 years old, some of them, which was discovered because someone found an old um, harpoon in a bowhead whale that was radio dated to being 200 years old. We've got narwhal, the unicorns of the sea with this just iconic tusk. Beluga whales, the canaries of the sea, called the canaries of the sea because they just, they make such cool sounds uh, and they're all over the place. Just, just really, really neat sounds that they can make. We've got bearded seals and I'm going to show you what's so cool about bearded seals in a minute with their vocalizations, but, uh, but a very neat uh, medium sized seal. And then ring seals, a small little seal that's kind of a, um, a main presence throughout all of the Arctic. Now, when we're thinking about what makes Arctic marine mammals special and unique, we think about their adaptations. So what parts their form and function that they've evolved to deal with. 
the Arctic environment. The Arctic is cold. One of its main defining features for the Arctic is that it's cold. So animals that specialize in living in the Arctic have to be able to deal with the cold. For marine mammals, these ones in particular have thicker blubber than their more southern or temperate counterparts. So they've got a thick layer of fat underneath their skin called blubber. They also have to deal with sea ice. They're living in ice-covered waters for most of the year. So for the whales, this is a reduced dorsal fin, the fin on their back. It's smaller or nearly absent. For this beluga whale here in this photo, you can see just a little, little dark triangle. That's all that there is for a dorsal fin for them. And the same thing with bowheads and narwhal. They have thick skulls, these whales, because they use their skulls to crack through ice sometimes. A bowhead whale can crack through 60 centimeters of ice. Belugas and narwhal, it's probably closer to 10 centimeters because they're a much smaller whale. But for bowheads, that's a pretty thick piece of ice that they can actually get to. For our seals, which I haven't talked about as much on this slide, uh, they have large claws, which they use for digging through the ice. In fact, ring seals specifically, they dig through the ice all winter long to create breathing holes so they can get into the water, they can swim around, and then they come up to the surface and they stick their nose into this little hole to get a breath. And they, they maintain those with their claws. They also use their claws for building, build, digging out layers um, where they can uh, keep their young safe when their young are born. So all Arctic marine mammals rely on sea ice. Seals use sea ice for hauling out. So that's when they take themselves out of the water. Um, they hang out on top of these ice flows. They use it for mating, for birthing, for raising their young. Whales use ice for one, as a predator defense, for example, narwhal in um, Nunavut have been shown to use the ice more when killer whales are present because killer whales want to eat them. So the narwhal head over to the sea ice and they hang out in the sea ice because killer whales have these huge dorsal fins on their back and they can't get through the ice as well. So, so killer whales are using that ice as a predator defense. Um, many of these species also hang around ice because that's where their preferred food items are. They, uh, for example, beluga, narwhal, and ring seal all eat small fish called Arctic cod, and Arctic cod hang out where the sea ice is. So sea ice is very important to these animals. It's not just something that they have to deal with in the environment, something they have to go around. They actually use it to the benefit of their lives. Come on. All right, I have a video here that's loading up. This is from NASA showing you changes in sea ice through time. And I'm going to play it. And here we go. I'm not going to play all of it. I'm just going to explain it. In the this beginning animation, of it to you. we're taking Arctic sea ice into the third dimension. And I'm actually going to here. mute that video just so you can hear my voice over top. So the sea ice is shown here in white. And it's going through time here every year, every winter. The sea ice expands and it covers the entire Arctic Ocean. It goes down um, Baffin Bay here between Greenland and Baffin Island. It goes down into the Bering Sea. So that's that kind of lighter colored white. The dark white in the middle is our multi-year ice. Ice that's been around and doesn't melt every year. It's, it's there every year. So what this animation is showing is sea ice through time that seasonal cycle of expanding in the wintertime and contracting, shrinking in the summertime to just cover the middle of the Arctic Ocean. Now I'm gonna go skip further down here to the end of the video. So this is the more recent years. This is 2010 and you can see there's less and less ice in the summertime. It's shrinking to a smaller and smaller coverage in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. This is one of the main effects of human caused climate change that we're getting less and less ice every year. Here's the end of this cycle for this video. Um, this compares September of 1984 to September of 2016. And what you can see there is that in 2016, there is much, much, much less coverage of the sea ice. September is the month of the year that has the least amount of sea ice. What does this mean for the animals that we're dealing with here? Um, the animals that um, that we're studying. So we know that these animals rely on sea ice for a bunch of different functions. They um, dic sea ice dictates when they migrate. So, for example, um, in the Western Arctic, in the Pacific Arctic, bowhead and beluga whales spend their winters in the Bering Sea and their summers up in the uh, Western Canadian Arctic, in the area that I study in, and they go to the Bering Sea because ice is thick throughout the Central Arctic Ocean and the Beaufort Sea in the wintertime, 
And so it's difficult for them to deal with. So they go down to the Bering Sea to the ice edge and they spend their time there and they start migrating as the ice starts to break up in the springtime. So less ice, um, ice melting earlier, forming later in the year. Uh, could mean that they start shifting their timing of migration, shifting the areas that they use. Less ice also means that different species are starting to invade the Arctic. We're getting much, much uh, more southern species than we used to. For example, uh, capelin and sand lance, a bunch of different salmon species that were not historically in the Arctic, but now are up in the Arctic. And these species are starting to be eaten by our marine mammals. We're getting more competition with southern species, for example. So it, over in the Bering Sea, Bering Strait up into Chukchi Sea, uh, we're getting humpback whales and gray whales and lots of uh, even minke whales, southern species that have not been up utilizing the Arctic. And these species may be competing with bowhead whales for food. Um, killer whales are another one coming in and they're coming in and they're eating the marine mammals. So there's a novel predator coming into the system that wasn't in the system as much as it used to be. Finally, because of this less sea ice, there's more access for human activities, more, more shipping that's happening in the Arctic, more cruise ships, more bulk carriers and tankers all coming into the Arctic because the resources are more available for people to use. It's easier to travel around. And the Arctic is also a shorter route to get from the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean. So many different reasons for ships to come through and this is all leading to increased ship traffic. So what do I do? Jesse mentioned that I listen to, um, to the sounds underwater to study the animals that live there. So underwater listening is what I do. I listen to marine mammal sounds and I listen to the noise from ships. And I'm gonna play for you some examples of the sounds made by marine mammals. Here are bearded seals. I mentioned they're pretty cool sounding animals. They make these long trill sounds. Uh, male bearded seals are using it to advertise to females that it's it's time for mating season and they can hold these notes for 60 seconds or longer just incredible it's like can you imagine holding a whistle for that long it's just a crazy sound and they do it they just fill up the entire soundscape during the breeding season our other seal the ring seal uh here's what they sound like <laughs> Their calls are called, called barks and yelps. They go, those are the barks, and they, those are the yelps, and they do lots of different sounds like that. Beluga whales are our canaries of the sea. They whistle and they chirp and they do echolocation clicks and pulse calls. These are a series of contact calls from them. There are these pulsed, screechy sounds mixed in with some whistles. And here's a bowhead whale, our low frequency specialist. <laughs> bowhead whales are a big whale. They make a very loud call. When they sing, and they do sing in the over the winter and in the springtime, their singing notes can be heard from up to a hundred kilometers away. Just incredibly loud animals. And finally, this isn't a marine mammal, but this is the ship noise that they have to listen to. If you've ever been swimming in a lake and have heard a boat go by, it's like that, but big ships are even louder than that. And that's what these animals are having to deal with. And it, and it has big implications for these animals. Now, these um, animals are, some of them are migratory, like I said. The bowhead and beluga whales are spending their winters down in the Bering Sea and their um, summers up in the Beaufort Sea. So uh, whereas some of the species are um, residents, so they just spend their entire summers um, up in the region. They're not migrating away from the sea ice. So that was a ring seal that I showed you or, or even bearded seals, they're residents. Whereas our beluga whales and our bowhead whales are migrating up to the Canadian Arctic for their summer times and then migrating back to Alaska for their winter times. So with these underwater acoustics, with putting microphones uh, called hydrophones underwater, we can listen to when these animals arrive in the area. So this map 
um, is just kind of a relatively zoomed in version of where I have acoustic data from, all of the different areas we've been collecting acoustic data. And we don't have to get into the main points, um, into the details of all of these different locations, but they're all placed for strategic reasons um, to try and get at patterns of when these animals are arriving so that we can kind of look at long-term trends about when they're in the area. This is what these instruments actually look like. So top left photo here, that's me setting up those big yellow acoustic recorders with a hydrophone on the end um, in some uh, workspace in Inuvik, Northwest Territories. Um, the top right actually is a zoomed in photo of what the hydrophone looks like. So that black bit is the hydrophone, the underwater microphone, all the gunk around it, that hydrophone's been under the water for a year. So that's algae that's built up on, on the instrument itself. We go out and we deploy these things in small boats as shown in the bottom left there. And sometimes when they come up from the bottom, they can be covered in all sorts of gunk, which is shown here by all of the kelp and algae that's wrapped around this hydrophone. So we get out to some pretty incredible areas to deploy this. Um, in some cases, we take a small plane and we land with that plane on a beach. And then we have to blow up our inflatable boat and get out on the ocean and, and get our recorders in the water or the year later, go back and pull the recorders out of the water. Uh, we've also recently started working with folk, um, with government scientists on icebreakers. And this is uh, the very right photo there. That's what our mooring looks like. So it's got a big hunk of chain at the bottom. That's the weight that drops, drags the thing to the bottom. The yellow pieces here are actually what we call an acoustic release. So that's how we um, we send a signal down to it and it lets go of the chain and things float to the surface and that lets us get our instrument back a year later when we want it. And then above that are our instruments, the acoustic recorder, as well as a, um, an, a water quality measure device called a conductivity temperature depth measurement device. And then up at the top are four big white floats that, um, that keep the thing off the bottom. So that's, that's kind of what the data collection looks like. Then after that, I get back a year of data and we have to go through it. We have to look for all the marine mammal sounds and listen to the marine mammal sounds. We have to look for the ship noise. We have to just measure uh, everything we can effectively from this data. What have we found so far? Well, in some of our early studies, we've looked at kind of seasonal patterns and where the, when the animals occur at different sites. So this is a site from Western Victoria Island called Ulahuktuk. And the different colored bars here show, um, show when the animals are around. The bars on the left there, the, the black hashed bars and the white bars, those are our whales. They're there in July and August, and then they kind of drop off as they migrate away. The, um, the gray bars, the solid gray bar and the hash gray bars, those are our seals, and they start calling as the ice forms. Ice is shown on here as this gray line um, where it's low in the summertime when the whales are there, and then it increases and covers pretty much the entire water body um, with ice, and that's when the seals start calling. We also uh, hear some fish. Fish make sounds too. Uh, and these are the black bars showing up in the data. So we get this kind of nice standard seasonal pattern where we hear the whales a lot in the summertime and we hear the, hear the seals a lot in the wintertime. We also hear a lot of ships. This figure on the right with the white bars and the black bars, those are all of the sh um, ship signals that we're finding in there. Small boats in white and large boats in black. And so we're seeing lots of ship noise between late July and mid-September. And that overlaps with those whales and, uh, and a few seal calls and a few fish calls, but really lots of overlap with the whales. However, because we've got a lot of data, we can look for new patterns. One thing that we found recently, it actually just got accepted in a scientific journal today, um, was that we found out that bowhead whales spent a winter in the Western Canadian Arctic even though they're normally supposed to be two to 3,000 kilometers away in the Bering Sea. They spent at least one winter at our site, in, um, at these four sites actually shown up here on the, the figure, in um, the Western Canadian Arctic, in the Eastern Beaufort Sea. Other things that we're doing with the acoustic data, we're trying to figure out how these animals are being impacted by underwater noise. So here's a, here's a study, um, the map here on the, on the left, shows you where a hydrophone was located and all the ship tracks in red those red lines are all the ships that went by that hydrophone went through the data through the acoustic data and um, counted the number of beluga vocalizations were happening and we found that belugas stopped vocalizing when ships came by it could be that they went quiet because of that noisy ship or it could be 
that they just left the area and we were no longer hearing them. But but good evidence that we're showing a behavioral change from the belugas that are caused by the ships. Finally, another study that we just had come out was, was looking at a broader scale. So kind of not using our acoustic data anymore, but using a bunch of big data sets. So one was um, satellite tagged beluga and bowhead whales that we used to define where the animals were living. And these are shown by the green and pinkish colored boxes, um, uh, shapes up there on the map. So showing where the animals are living. And then the black lines are all the ship tracks. And we were looking at ship tracks going through these whale areas, as well as modeling how much noise was being caused by these ships. And we're seeing lots of overlap between ships and whales. Um, and we're able to key in on certain hot spots that maybe we need to do something about. Maybe we need to try and reduce the impact of these ships on these whales in, in specific areas. So what does all of this mean? I'm doing lots of different pieces of research and there's lots going on. But one thing that we can say for sure is that the Arctic where these animals are living is changing quickly. The habitat is disappearing. These animals are getting more disturbance from ships. And this leads to the question, how will Arctic marine mammals respond? And that's where my work comes in. We need to continue the work for many years to come to try and track changes in these animals. We showed that bowhead whales are spending, spent one winter um, in an area where they're at in the wintertime. But what's going to happen in the future? Will this become more common? Will beluga whales also start spending the winters here instead of migrating? So this is why we need these long-term studies in these very remote areas. And with that, a huge thank you to all of you for listening. And I'd love to hear what questions you have. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Bill, as always. What a neat presentation. And I love the feedback on YouTube when you played all the sounds. That was awesome. We've got groups joining us in Mexico, in Poland, Canada, the U.S., and more. So a truly intercontinental program today. Welcome into all our students from around the globe. Uh, if you are on YouTube, do share questions in the chat bar. We're going to dive in with Q&A and take as many as possible. But I'm going to start by going live to our, our, our live classes with us today. We've got four groups from across uh, North America. Uh, Mr. Seberger, uh, if you want to unmute your microphone, pass along a question on behalf of your class. I'll come to you to begin and uh, take us away. Hi, Mr. Uh, hi. Uh, first of all, thank you, William, for uh, meeting with us. Uh, it's been very informative. We've been actually going into a unit on conservation of energy. And one of our questions for you would be, how does energy conservation help the oceans and marine life? And can we reverse the damage to the sea ice? All right, so energy conservation, I assume you're, you're talking about maybe relying less on fossil fuels and relying more on um, more naturally derived power, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so one big thing that's going on with shipping in the Arctic right now is debates around something called black carbon. So black carbon is um, released from ships that are burning dirty oil effectively, and that um, you know, you see smoke coming out of the smokestack of a ship, for example. It come, it goes up into the atmosphere, and then it comes down. And in the Arctic, it lands on the sea ice. And then it just creates a feedback loop so that that ice melts faster because of that black carbon landing on it. So ships that are relying on this dirty fossil fuel are just amplifying the effects of climate change. So if we can get into ship traffic in the Arctic that's not relying on fossil fuels, it's burning a cleaner fuel or ideally going to some sort of um, naturally renewable resource like um, electric boats or relying more on wind power. Um, that's funny enough, been a trend recently is um, container ships relying on sails to get across the Atlantic, for example. If we can do something similar in the Arctic, that will be big in terms of reducing the impact of fossil fuel burning on amplifying the effects of climate change. In terms of actually um, getting sea ice back. That's that's a tough one. Um, and it's it's out of my expertise for one, but, but I'll give it my best shot to answer it. Uh, from what we can tell right now, if we stop burning all fossil fuels right now, we're already set on a trajectory to lose most of our sea ice. And so we're gonna need to wait for the earth to bounce back effectively, but, if we continue burning at the rate that we're currently burning at, we're gonna lose that ice a lot quicker. So 
we can at least slow the effects of climate change by by reducing our reliance on fossil fuels and we're going to have to just continue monitoring the animals to see how they're reacting to to that loss of sea ice to see what we can do to help to continue conserving them because unfortunately it's um there's already enough of a feedback loop going that that sea ice loss is happening and and there's not much we can do to stop it at this point that was a, a great and very deep question to kick us off with, Mr. Seaburger. So thank you for that. <laughs> Heavy hitting to begin with. Um, we'll go with softball for the rest of them. Uh, we'll start with this McCray's class. If you guys want to join us in London, I just unmute your microphone and you can come on in. I'll wait to see if you can do that in the backdrop. And I can always, oh, there we go. Come on in, Ms. McCray. Go for it. Hi. Right. Sorry, my daughter is also here right now. So. That's after fun. Uh, okay. <laughs> I have two questions. Number one, we noticed that you have a friend in the background and we were wondering what his or her name was. Which friend can you see right now? The dog. I can only see one friend. Yes, the dog. Oh, that is Sherlock. He is my pointer dog. Um, <laughs> I do have three dogs and a cat running around in my background. So nice. <laughs> my right. four-year-old daughter is not running around in the background today though. So uh, you don't get the joy of her. <laughs> Um, and our question was, hold on, let me go back to it. Uh, which animal has been the most affected by the climate change in the Arctic? We've heard a lot about polar bears in other places, but which animal do you think is the most affected? Um, ooh, I'm going to have to go with very likely Arctic cod, actually. So ti the tiny little fish that I mentioned early on, they their main food source is, is, is um, a sea ice algae. So as as the sea ice shrinks back, that little fish is um, there. The areas where they can live the way they used to live is shrinking rapidly. Um, so, and they've got lots and lots of other competitor fish coming in and competing with them. So, yeah, I would I would probably have to go with Arctic cod right now. Great question, guys. I love that. I love the backdrop of the dog. That's exciting. We'll try and see if we can get all the canines in the background throughout the rest of the broadcast. Um, I want to head now to Miss Cazola's class. Miss Cazola's class is joining us in Guelph, right down the road from me. Just unmute that microphone, guys, and uh, take us away. Hi. So Hello. we have two questions, if that's okay. Go for um, it. We to be asking too, so let's do it. Okay. The first one is, what is your favorite noise that you hear um, from the water? And the second one is, why did you decide to research about the Arctic? All right. So my favorite noise. That's a tough question. I love all the noises. Um, I'm going to have to go with ring seals. They're, they're barks and yelps. They're just, they're, they're so quiet normally. And when I get to hear one really clearly, it's always a treat. Um, and they're just such a neat noise. They, they remind me of a puppy dog and yes, I have dogs in the background, so I probably have a soft spot for dogs, but, uh, but yeah, I would have to go with the ring seal barks and yelps. Um, why did I study, decide to study the Arctic? Um, I mean, it's a complicated question and partly has to do with opportunities that were available to me and jobs that were available to me. But the more interesting side is, um, I grew up in rural Northern Ontario and it, it's just, you know, starting with that remote, relatively remote landscape there, I, I just had a love for areas that had wide expanses without, um, you know, with, with sparse human populations. And the Arctic is just the extreme example of that. The area where I work has six communities out along the coastline, and each of them only has, you know, a maximum of 3,000 people. The smallest community has 120 people in it. So it's just, it's such a, a remote area with, um, with so much land that's just untouched by industrial development. The animals are free to do their natural behaviors, mostly unhindered by people and the things that we're doing. And so it's just such, a, such an incredible place. And, um, and I want to conserve that effectively. So, so I want to see these animals continue to be able to thrive and not be overrun by human activities. And um, that's that's really my main reason for, for wanting to do the work that I do. Yeah. 
It's a fantastic answer. And I mean, throughout today, throughout all our broadcasts, it's amazing how many people start off with this passion for the area that's near them, this passion for wild places. I mean, I think all of us, whether we're students, teachers, wherever we're joining from, from around the world right now, you know, there's a place that's special to you that you go and you love the biodiversity there, you love the landscape there. And so, you know, con conservation can start close to home. You guys might want to help protect some of the species that Bill gets to, to work with in the Arctic. You might want to protect species close to home in, in Poland, Mexico, across Canada, the US. Whatever it may be, that passion can really lead to some real concrete, great things going on. So I think that that's a fantastic answer. And thank you so much to Ms. Cazola's class for, for asking it. Um, let's head to Ms. McIntosh's class. They're the Tribune Trailblazers. They're joining us in Brampton. If you guys have a question for us, come on in. Or two. Keep hey, the trend going. Perfect. Yeah, we'll go for two. Um, Hussein, go for it. Hussein? Okay, so my question is that on an average, how much is it like record? How much does it like cost to get to those places that you want to put out like the recorders? And like, how much does it cost to get them and like put them there? And how much does it cost to like retrieve like retrieve them after it's recorded its one year span? Oh, that's a good question. So it's very expensive. So just for me to get to Inuvik, which isn't at any of the communities. It costs me, I think, roughly about $1,600 round trip, so $1,600. Then I have to get out. Um, so, for example, when, when we do our work with the charter flights, with those planes that are landing on the beach, those cost about ten dollars to $15,000 a day. So if we are able to fly, say, two days of flying to go get the recorders and back, there's, you know, let's, let's call it twenty dollars to $30,000. So that, that would be that cost. The other one is those icebreaker ships um, that, that we use. They, um, those government icebreaker ships cost about $30,000 a day to run. And so when they're going out to do our work, they're, um, usually they can do our stuff within about half a day and they're doing other jobs at the same time. So we're paying $15,000 um, to support their operations to go out and get our gear. So it is not remotely cheap to work in the arctic uh, and that's that has nothing to do with even my time to analyze the data just just the field costs and that and that didn't include you know staying staying in very expensive places that cost 250 dollars a day to stay at night there um, which is the case for all of these remote arctic places that i go to so um yeah you need to have a healthy research budget for that you sure do. And I, I really like this question. We're getting this more and more in a lot of our broadcasts. And I love that kids are thinking about sort of the, the, the financing behind science. I always like to stress, and I think this is really important to note, because, you know, these, these volumes of thousands or millions or billions of dollars with research come up quite regularly. And it represents such a small fraction of what Canada or what the United States spends on everything. It usually represents about less than 1%, something between less than 1% to up to 2%, depending on the country in the world, for all the science, all the research, all this gear, all your time to make this possible. And I think that that is something that, you know, as we've seen over the last 100 years, the countries that do invest more in science and technology tend to do better economically and in a whole bunch of other ways. So I think that that's a really important note. So thanks for the question, uh, Hussein. That was great. Uh, We'll come back to you, Ms. McIntosh. You said you had two questions, so take us away. Awesome. So, Sophia, you're up next. Sophia? My question is, what can we kids do to help save the animals and the ice? Yes. The best question. All right. Great question. Um, well, I can't bring you into the field with me to do research, unfortunately, at this time. So you can't have your hands on doing that. But one thing that you can do is continue to learn and continue to ask questions and continue to show adults that it's an important thing. So I have a young daughter and when I see that she's excited about something, I want to learn more about it and I want to teach her more about it. So doing the same thing with your parents, with your teachers, with that can have big impacts and can also shape the trajectory of what you end up doing with your life. And it may mean that someday you can be a scientist and you can go out and you can help conserve these species, for example. I love that answer. And it's one we've got, I mean, the question is one we've gotten in every one of our broadcasts today. We're going to be getting it throughout the week. And sort of the central message we like to highlight as an organization is don't waste. This can be emissions with your car. If you want to bike or walk to work or school, this can be don't waste food. When you go to the grocery store, eat whatever you buy. It can be pack a little as lunch and avoid plastic from getting out into habitats. I mean, that mindset of just using what you need and only that as much as possible, not always, it's not always possible to do that. But when you can, makes a really big positive difference for health 
helping ecosystems, habitats, and species. So great question from Ms. McIntosh, student. Uh, thank you guys so, so much for sharing that. And again, throughout the week, we're gonna be sharing a ton of resources on our website, on our social media, and more on how you guys can take action from home. I want to go uh, to YouTube for a quick question. We've got a few questions there and I'll come back to our live groups. We are whipping through these because Bill is like a Q&A pro and knows all about how to get as many answers in as possible. Miss Fromm's class, they wanted to know, uh, can animals get injured or killed uh, or made deaf from all that boat noise that you were highlighting? Great question. And I didn't get into that today just because of time. Uh, but underwater noise has four main impacts on um, marine animals. The first is what we call acoustic masking, where the animal has trouble hearing what it's trying to hear. So think about yourself walking into a noisy classroom with all the kids talking and everyone's trying to speak over each other. It's hard to hear what you're trying to hear, right? But when that, um, when everyone goes quiet, when the teacher tells you to be quiet and to sit down at your desks, it's easier to hear what's going on. So that's, that's kind of the first basic impact of underwater noise. The next is the behavioral impacts where the animal changes what it's doing. The animal can stop eating. It can uh, change its diving cycle. It could leave an area entirely. Um, so those are behavioral disturbances. Next up is hearing damage. So when you get a really loud noise, it can cause you to have either temporary or permanent hearing damage. Ship noise is mostly below the threshold for that, unless the animal is right at the ship for long periods of time or it has lots and lots of ships going over top of it. So for the most part, hearing damage isn't a main cause, um, a, a main concern around ship noise, but it can be. Um, for other things like um, uh, underwater explosions and underwater construction and e something called um, seismic surveys, which are used in the Arctic and in other areas uh, to explore the seabed, um, to look for oil and other things, um, those are very loud sources and can cause hearing damage very easily if the animal is close to it. Um, death can happen, uh, something called barotrauma, where if it's a really loud sound, it can actually explode internal organs or blood vessels. But, but again, it has to be a very loud sound for that. Um, there have also been kind of indirect causes where the sound itself didn't cause death, but the animal's reaction to the sound caused death. So uh, beaked whales in um, in the ocean have been shown to react to sonar from the Navy. So the Navy puts out these high frequency sounds that they use to learn what's in their environment, and animals react very strongly to these sounds. So it's been shown that beaked whales, so they're very deep diving whales, they'll hear that and they'll uh, surface or dive deep, they'll change their depth very rapidly in response to that noise. And, um, and they'll get something called the bends or decompression sickness. Dive, anyone who's paid attention to divers, uh, people diving in the water will know what decompression sickness is. And that can lead, lead to death. Um, so those are, those are kind of effectively the main, the main impacts. But in terms of ships in the Arctic, we're mostly focused on the behavioral disturbance and the acoustic masking. So where the animal can't hear what it's trying to hear. Yeah. Thanks so much for that question on YouTube, guys. I was really hoping we were going to get one like that. Uh, let's dive back in with our live class as we have time for another round with all our live groups. So, Mr. Seaberger, if you want to kick us off and, and unmute that mic, come on back in. We'll go to you first and then go back through our, our lineup. Hey, Mr. Seaberger. Oh, I uh, had one about, you know, we had, you had the picture on there and exploring by the sea to view in the, the extreme Arctic conditions with your beard all... Uh, Started to get all frozen. And so the first question I actually got from students was, uh, how cold is it out there and, and how do you stay warm? Ah, good question. Uh, so I do work in the summertime usually when it's somewhere between 3 degrees Celsius and say 10 degrees Celsius where I'm working. So that's not too bad. You know, that's like spring temperatures wherever you are right now. Um, you can dress for that no problem. But I have been out on the ice in February, which is what that photo is from. It was minus 25 to minus 30 Celsius, I think. Wasn't too windy that day, so thankfully we didn't have much of a wind chill. But um, staying warm on the ice is a trick. So you have to have a good warm parka um, with lots of layers underneath. Um, we also had a, a wind shelter on the ice, a tent that had propane heaters in it so that we could go in and get warmed up. Um, for that work, we, we were drilling holes in the ice, and then we were dropping some of these acoustic recorders through the water down to the bottom. 
So we had to keep all of our electronic equipment warm. So we had to keep it in the heated tent. Some of the things, you know, you'd keep in your pockets inside your coat, like my camera, uh, to keep it nice and frost free. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the big thing. Lots of layering and getting out of the cold um, into that warm shelter when you get a chance just to get feeling back in your fingers. A classic Arctic cold question. So thank you for Mr. Seaburger for that. And I want to note tomorrow, if you guys want to see the Arctic as it is in the summer in a really beautiful way, Paul Sokolov's presentation is going to talk about all the amazing flowers and plants up in the Arctic. So it's going to be a really cool talk if you want to tune in on our YouTube channel. I want to go to Ms. Uh, Ms. McRae's class now and the Ms. Cazoles in a minute. So Ms. McRae, if you want to unmute your mic and come on in, go for it. So uh, the question we have is, is red algae a problem in the Arctic? Um, I don't know about red algae specifically. There are some toxic algae blooms that have, um, have happened. And this is way outside of my area of expertise. So I can't remember the specific name of the algae. Um, but it has, um, there definitely has been some monitoring to, um, to make sure that it's not showing up in seals and um and in whales for example there were a few beluga whales that died in my study area a year back and that was the first thing that they did was check to make sure that it wasn't this toxic algal bloom that um had caused issues it hadn't but uh, but they have seen that i believe in alaska a bit that it's been um, affecting seabirds and possibly seals there as well so it can be an issue and and especially as the arctic warms up there's longer periods without ice and there's a lots and lots of light that makes it into the water column in the Arctic with 24 hour sunlight in the summertime. So there's a lot of chance for algal blooms to happen. So uh, it's, it's certainly a concern and something that is being monitored. Cool research question, guys. Love when people look up things behind the scenes ahead of time and ask questions like that and throw off our speakers. Way to go, guys. We're going to get all the, the main areas of expertise over the course of the week. So that was fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Ms. McRae. Uh, Ms. Cazola's class, and then we'll wrap up with Ms. McIntosh in a minute. Ms. Cazola, come on up and unmute that mic. We have another double question. Do it. Do it. How many polar bears have become extinct due to climate change and how many different types of animals or species live in the Arctic? Nice. Wow. Okay. Um, answer to the first question, none. No population of polar bears has become extinct because of climate change. It is a concern. It um, Sea ice loss will, will very likely have a, a strong impact on polar bears and many of them are at risk of extinction. That means that the, the population may be decreasing right now and because of sea ice loss and, and their inability to go out and, and get their favorite food, which are ring seals, uh, there is a chance that they will go extinct. So, uh, but none yet, thankfully. So that's a good thing, but it is something that we're very concerned about, of course. Number of species in the Arctic. I do not have an answer to that. I can answer it about marine mammals. Um, so we, and it's a tricky question because there are what we call the endemic Arctic marine mammals. These are the marine mammals that are specialized on living in the Arctic and the sea ice. There are five of those and I listed them off plus polar bears. Polar bears are technically a marine mammal. I just don't count them because they're not like the others. Um, so with polar bears, there are six. So there's polar bears, narwhal, beluga, bowhead, ring seals, bearded seals. There are a number of other species that spend that are specialized on living at the sea ice at the subarctic area. Those are uh, ribbon seals and um, spotted seals and harp seals and hooded seals. And then there are a number of marine mammals that come up in the summertime, but then spend their winters much, much further south. And those are gray whales and humpback whales and sperm whales and northern bottlenose whales and minke whales and killer whales. It's a very long list, so it always depends on how you want to define it. In terms of fish species, uh, there's a really good book that just came out called um, uh, Arctic Marine Fishes of the Canadian Arctic or something along those lines, and it lists every single fish species known in the Canadian Arctic, for example. I don't have a number off the top of my head, though. I can see the textbook from here, but it'll take me too long to find the answer for you. That was a great answer, though. I think you are going to get a lot of angry letters from some polar bear biologists at the end of this broadcast, so stay tuned for that. But <laughs> that, uh, ignore that. For our classes that are keen on polar bears, incidentally, because we were bound to get that question, Alisa McCall and Taya Beshoft uh, have amazing presentations on our YouTube channel about them, and I really like the opportunity to hear about all sorts of amazing other Arctic species, obviously. So thank you so much, Ms. Cazola's class. Ms. McIntosh, if you want to wrap us up, with one more question come on in take us away 
Awesome. I've got Prana. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, my question is, uh, one second. Um, what is your inspiration? Um, who was your support, or what was your support, and what is your goal? Like, what do you want to achieve? All right. My my inspiration for doing Arctic work has to do with um, just growing up, growing up in rural areas, spending a lot of time out in the forest, and just just being really interested in animals and wanting to wanting to see them last into future gener generations, wanting to see these animals being available for other people to be inspired by. Um, that's probably my biggest generation. Right now, I think a lot about my young daughter who who I want to be able to know the Arctic like I know the Arctic. Um, support, ooh, I've had, I'm gonna assume you mean maybe from a, a, a specific person, for example. So my, my parents were very supportive of me studying biology spending 10 years after high school being a student. Um, and without their support, I, I would not be where I am today. My wife was also a huge support to me, allowing me to be able to spend weeks at a time doing field work while she's here at home with my daughter, um, looking after our dogs and our house. So so there's lots of different types of support that I, that I receive and lots of people who support me. Um, what is the last question? The last one was, what's your goal? Like, what do you aim to do with this field and then with your career? All right, with, all right, goal. Good, good great question. <laughs> I, I like to, my goal is to continue doing work that matters, work that, work that interests me that matters more, more importantly. So, so I am interested in continuing to work on cool animals um, up in the Arctic. And really the, the big goal there is to see some, policy changes that positively affects those animals. So whether that's um, policies that affect ships and make it so that ships have a reduced impact on these animals, that's one of my big goals. Seeing protected areas set up so that these animals have a place to thrive without any human activities in them or with limited human activities in them. That That is a huge, uh, a huge one of my goals. And, and it's those are very long-term goals because it takes a long time for these things to happen. So yeah, continuing continuing to do research that matters that can lead us towards getting some of those important policy changes, I, I would say. That was a beautiful and thoughtful answer. And I think uh, all our teachers can agree that that is exactly the reason why I love having Bill on the broadcast so much. Uh, you are the first person ever to mention the support of your parents and partner in that way ever in over a thousand broadcasts that I've highlighted. So thank you for that. Because I think that's a really important message for kids and for anyone who's going into research for some of our, our older audience that's tuning in today. So thank you for that. Um, what I want to do now is just bring up a few quick things. We are, we're over time as we are rebels. And this was such a fun broadcast that we just had to take more questions than we could possibly do in, in one normal session. Um, but I do want to highlight for anyone else who's keen, exploringbytheseat.com, our entire lineup of climate festival programs is there. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want to watch this program again or any one of our other I know we had a student ask about how you can take action and sort of fall in love with wildlife and be inspired to do things uh, like Dr. Halliday does. Our backyard bio program in May is set to do just that. We want to encourage kids from all around the world to get out, explore their local biodiversity, connect with one another and share their love for nature and wildlife. I'm going to be doing an info session for that at 4 Eastern today, also on our YouTube channel, so do check that out. And then finally, if you want to find out more about Bill's amazing work, WCS Canada, so Wildlife Conservation Society Canada, and his website at Wheatley.com. Amazing stuff. More of those soundscapes. You can listen into Bearded Seals, which is my favorite thing in nature to listen to. It's like an alien landing on the planet. It's incredible. Um, as you can tell, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about all this too. This is a great time. Um, Bill, thank you so much for spending time with us today. I really, really appreciate it, man. It was great to be here. Thank you for so many great questions from all of you. Yeah, great question today. You guys all rock. And what we do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to bring in Mr. Seaburger, Ms. McIntosh, and Ms. Cazola to say a quick thank you and goodbye for joining us today. Thank you, guys.